Today on The Novelizers, from MST3K, Mary Jo Peel. From Robot Chicken, Kevin Shinnick, plus Jesse Glasgow and intern Kevin Carter. Now here's your host, Andy Richter. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Richter. I bet you a dollar you've never heard of the play The Spanish Tragedy, written by Thomas Kidd in 1592. Well, guess what? Shakespeare totally ripped off its plot to write a little play you may have heard of called Hamlet. True story. So I'm taking a cue from Shakespeare and ripping off some of the greatest stories of our generation, blockbuster Hollywood films, and then converting them into amazing literature that will be required reading in classrooms long after those original films are forgotten. Got a problem with that? Well, Sue William Shakespeare, not me. But wait, it gets better. Because I'm also taking a cue from Andy Warhol by not actually writing or narrating that literature myself. I'm having my factory of great writers and actors do that for me while I sit back and relax until it's time to stab my name all over the finished product, which is this podcast. I call it The Novelizers. This season on the podcast, we're novelizing the film that put Ricardo Montalban on the space map, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And here to tell us where we are in the story is my intern, Kevin. Kevin, get out of the supply cabinet and tell our audience what's going on. Sure thing, Andy. So Chekhov and his buddies are looking for a totally lifeless planet because Dr. Marcus and her son need one to test a new invention called Genesis. Chekhov beams down to a potential planet and finds the planet is inhabited by Khan and his evil gang, who capture Chekhov and put some weird alien mind slug in his ear, then interrogates him about where Kirk is. Wow, what a cliffhanger. I can't wait to find out what happens next. And thanks to novelizer Liz Lent and narrator Mystery Science Theater 3000's Mary Jo Peel, I don't have to. Mary Jo, make it so. Chapter five. This one has farts and lady jokes. Novelized by Liz Lent, narrated by Mary Jo Peel. Kirk turned the page of his book and tried to focus on the duty ahead. It was difficult not to be distracted. Having already read How to Look Like a Guy in Charge while mitigating naturally off-putting and sexist character flaws while slowly turning pages without taking in any information, part two. He'd been a big fan of part one, but this volume had less sex and only one cartoon. Sighing, he closed the book silently composing his one-star Goodreads review, which would read, Not enough sex and only one cartoon. He heard a voice over the radio say, Enterprise to Admiral Kirk's shuttle. You're cleared for docking. Approach portside Torpedo Bay. Kirk rose and went into the cockpit, where Sulu was piloting, and Uhura was there just because. Sometimes she liked to tag along, but then randomly disappear from future scenes, where no mention would ever be made of the fact that here she is now, sitting in the goddamn cockpit, and then five minutes from now, when everyone else is getting off the shuttle, she's nowhere to be seen. Where did she go? Is she circling the block for a parking spot? Did she go to the duty-free shop? Don't worry, we'll never, ever know. Anyway, back in the shuttle where Uhura was maybe having a Schrodinger's cat-like experience, Kirk stood behind Sulu's shoulder and watched as the Enterprise came into view. It was pretty big and white, like Kirk's neighborhood back home. Enterprise, this is Admiral Kirk's party on final approach, said Sulu. (laughs) You bet it is, thought Kirk. He prided himself on his ability to party, although lately he'd felt uncertain about his DJing skills. He just couldn't get into new music. Too anemic, and he didn't even want to get started on the topic of auto-tuning, which was a goddamn abomination, letting any old pretty face squawk his way to the top with vocal lies. Secretly, Kirk wished he'd had auto-tuning when he fronted his band, Kirk and no one else, in high school. Technology was never there when you needed it, he thought, as he watched the futuristic space shuttle dock with the futuristic spaceship. Anyway, 
Back to reality. Here he was, crammed into his admiral's outfit, about to spend an afternoon with a bunch of kids. Boring. I hate inspections, he said. Sulu, chipper as always, and so fucking contrarian, chimed in. I'm delighted. Any chance to go aboard the Enterprise? Sigh. Whatever. Kirk just stared out the window and silently thanked the universe that he only had to spend an afternoon with this dork and not go off on another half-cocked adventure that would go on for at least another 90 minutes, not including the credits. Bones came up behind them, sneaking in like a mitten-pawed cat, quietly shedding and attempting to lick himself. Kirk nodded, hello, and tapped his foot as Sulu took the longest route possible to their parking spot. Kirk knew it was because Sulu didn't feel comfortable backing into a spot. Parallel parking freaked him the fuck out, and it showed in his shuttle piloting. Kirk decided to play nice and said to Sulu, Well, I, for one, am delighted to have you at the helm for three weeks. I don't think these kids can steer. They finally docked and were greeted at the airlock by Spock and a Vulcan who looked just like a TV actress it would be super easy to make cheers and Scientology jokes about. Permission to come aboard, Captain, said Kirk, not really meaning it. He didn't need anyone's permission to do anything and quietly farted just to prove the point. Spock raised an eyebrow but pretended to ignore the Admiral's indiscretion. When was he not farting? That's what you had to ask yourself these days about Kirk. It was an embarrassing thing to witness, even for a Vulcan. Welcome, Admiral. I think you know my training crew. Certainly, they have come to know you. Because I told them about the farts, he thought. Yes, we've been through death and life together, said Kirk, also thinking of the farts. Some weird lady next to them blew a whistle, but no puppies scampered forth. It turned out not to be a dog whistle, which was disappointing, so they all shrugged and went to visit what your narrator thought was the engine room, but turned out not to be the engine room at all, despite being filled with engineers. There in the indeterminate room, Kirk spotted his favorite Scottish stereotype and former engineer, Scotty, who also was not a dog, and... Kirk felt sad at the sad lack of canines on this visit. He'd brought the milk bones for nothing. Again. Kirk inquired about Scotty's health and general well-being. I had a wee bout, sir, but Dr. McCoy pulled me through, Scotty said. There's going to be a drinking joke now because Scottish people are drunk bastards. A wee bout of what? Kirk asked, walking right into the whole damn thing. Shore leave, Admiral, said Bones. There it was. Just move along. Don't even look at it. Kirk next approached a short, skinny fellow who he recognized from a bunch of 1970s Disney movies, but couldn't quite place and wasn't worth the time to look it up on IMDb because he wouldn't recognize the guy's name anyway. (sighs) Suffice to say, this little fellow would be dead by the end of Act Two. Kirk decided not to tell him all that and ruin his day, so instead he cheerfully said, And who do we have here? Midshipman, first class, Peter Preston, engineer's mate, sir. First training voyage, Mr. Preston, and last, Kirk thought. Yes, sir. Oh, man, dial it down a bit. I see, Kirk said. Sucker. What? Nothing. Kirk kept walking and asked Scotty, shall we start with the engine room? Scotty, the cocky drunk Scottish bastard, cockily said, We'll see you there, sir, and everything is in order. Alphabetical order. Finally, Kirk, being a cocky dick back, said, That'll be a pleasant surprise, Mr. Scott. Spock spoke. I'll see you on the bridge, Admiral. Kirk had totally forgotten he was there, as had we all. Not if I see you first, Kirk said, playfully tousling Spock's hair. Spock vowed for the thousandth time to kill that man, first chance he got. Savik, the name of the character who totally looks like Kirstie Alley, blew Spock's brain pan by speaking in Vulcan and spawning a whole new font in the subtitles. He's never what I expected, sir, she said. Spock responded in Vulcan and with a similar font. What surprises you? He's so human. Nobody's perfect, Savik. 
And they laughed and laughed and laughed in that quiet, grim, mirthless way that so many people mistake for frowning and not laughing. Meanwhile, back in the actual engine room, for God's sake, yes, this one really does look like an engine room. I don't know how I could have mistaken the other place for an engine room, but to be fair, everything is smooth and futuristic and Jordy wasn't there and that's usually how I know it's the engine room. So just stop getting on my back about this stuff. Jesus, mom. Anyway, Kirk walked into the engine room and greeted a bunch of engineers who he totally ignored instead choosing to make Scotty feel like less of a man by taking a handkerchief and wordlessly wiping off a console, which Scotty, honest to God, had worked days to polish. Scotty responded by smiling through his drunken Scottish tears. He squared his shoulders, ready for the Admiral's next cruelty. Well, Mr. Scott, are your cadets capable of handling a minor training cruise? Motherfucker, are yours? God damn, this guy was a prick. Scotty was so glad he wouldn't have to see him again, barring any unexpected plot twists. Give the word, Admiral, Scotty said, draping every word with abuse, none of which was heard because Scottish accents are ridiculous and everyone just thought he was joking about leprechauns. They laughed politely. When the confusion had subsided, Kirk said, Mr. Scott, the word is given. Aye, sir said Scotty, but he didn't really mean it. Kirk stepped on an elevator that appeared out of nowhere and began his slow apotheosis. Bones, looking up to his godlike overlord, said, Admiral, what about the rest of the inspection? Fuck no! Kirk stage whispered and flipped the bird to everyone in the engine room. Things got weird as it took a good minute and a half for the elevator to lift him out of sight, and holding his finger out for that long started to feel awkward. He regretted the execution of his action, not the intent. Outside, the Enterprise was auditioning for a film version of Cabaret as stage lights flipped on dramatically, highlighting its seductive white curves. It was just about to belt out Willkommen when we cut to the bridge and its chance for the EGOT was lost again. As Kirk and Bones stepped from the elevator, Sulu announced, Admiral on the bridge. The bridge was bustling with activity as everyone tried to pretend they knew what they were doing, flipping switches and tapping little glowy lights and wantonly launching torpedoes. It was pretty convincing. But that's when Spock began playing his dangerous, dangerous little game, letting a woman, a woman, mind you, drive the ship. He turned to Savik, who was sitting at one of those wall consoles, pretending to do things like everyone else. It actually looked like she was on the verge of a Connect Four when Spock rudely interrupted her. Lieutenant Savik, have you ever piloted a starship out of space dock? Well, never, sir, she said, knowing like everyone else that women weren't built to pilot golf carts, let alone spaceships, because how... Could they get their arms around their breasts to steer? It was simple biology, for God's sake. Kirk and Bones glanced at each other, praying this farce would end here. But no, Spock was a dangerous, adrenaline junkie who craved near death and total destruction. He stood up menacingly. Take her out, Mr. Savik, he ordered, caring not for the lives in his hands. Savik stood and walked past Kirk and Bones and sat in the captain's chair. Spock, trying to fool everyone into submission with false jollity, said, For everything, there is a first time, Lieutenant. Don't you agree, Admiral? Kirk, terrified in equal measure of his former first officer and the concept of a woman at the wheel, managed a tentative, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Bones, who'd seen so much he wasn't afraid of anything anymore except the power of the unspent love deep in his soul, looked at Kirk and said, Would you like a tranquilizer? Kirk shook his head. At this point, Savik totally, and perhaps inevitably, drove the ship into the side of the docking station, causing a horrible scraping sound that only abated when she finally got the ship over the curb, narrowly missing a designer shoe warehouse while shouting, I love the sails, don't you? And then finally gunning the engines so the space tires squealed. And they were off. (laughs) 
As always, here's my intern Kevin Carter, who interviewed one of the thousands of folks who made the movie Wrath of Khan a reality. Kevin, what did you discover? Hello, I'm Andy's intern, Kevin Carter, and I'm your host for the interview portion of The Novelizers. Today, I'm here with Jesse Glasgow, who is the sound engineer, or in other words, in charge of the beeps and boops. Hey, Jesse, how's it going? Hi there, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing all right. Um, you are a sound design designer, sound designer, correct? Mm-hmm. That's correct. Can you, yes. Can you explain? Can you explain to the audience what that is? Of course, I can. Um, uh, as a sign, sound designer, I I listen for how to tell the story, and then I create the sounds that assist the visual medium. So when there is Oh, say a door that opens. Uh, what might be the best sound for that? A whoosh, a slam, a bang? Well, it depends on the story. It depends on the moment. It depends on how much tension you want in that moment. Do you want to create fear? Do you want to create a sense of comfort? What what got you into this? What made you say, this is the job I want to do? Well, you know, I, I was in college, <laughs> a little bit of a, a, a drift, actually. Journalism. Mm, No, not for me. Uh, But what did get me while I was studying journalism was the clickety-clack tip-tap of my keyboard. It was just fascinating to me that I felt more strongly uh, about what I was writing or reading if there was sound attached to it. How did your parents take, you know what I'm saying, you, you changed? Because I can only assume that's more years of college, that's more money. They probably didn't have a lot. I can assume it could be very tough on their pockets for you just changing mid, you know, mid college career. Well, actually, it's interesting that you bring that up. I did them a favor. I dropped out and I moved out to Los Angeles with a suitcase and a dream. I I knew the only way to get started was to get started. Um, what do you think separated you from everybody else when it comes to that though? You know, because it seemed like a lot of people come to LA with that mindset. What what separated you? Oh, um, I think it was. Uh, the passion for sound, the commitment to sound itself. Uh, I'm a very noisy person. I'm, I may not come across as such a, in this setting. You seem like you have a, a plethora of knowledge when it comes to this. I wonder if you have like, you know, like a spidey sense type thing with just sounds. You can just hear more than what people can actually do. Well, I do have a heightened uh, awareness. I, I, I'm not sure that I have a heightened sense, you know. I have heard that uh, if one of your senses is weaker, that uh, you're, say, if you're a blind person, your sense of touch, taste, smell is heightened. I am not blind, but I do wear reading glasses. So maybe as I've aged, that's mm-hmm. assisted me in this yeah. In this environment, in this uh, industry. Okay, I want your best and worst. Your best sound that you did for the movie and the most difficult sound to do for the movie. Ah, uh, fortunately, they're one and the same. There was some debate about whether or not we were going to use Zoom's whooshes for the defense fields. In the end, we wound up marrying a beep and a boop. So it was more of a boop, which is oh, wow. it, it was just kind of a boop, boop. You, you couldn't call it a beep or a boop. Boop, 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 boop. But in succession, whip, 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 going oh. up, putting those defense fields up with that sound. It was challenging, and it, it it took a lot of uh, it took a lot of taming of the sound to get the sound we wanted. So I was very proud of that moment because it was a big moment in the movie. And my, I will say my dad, my dad was proud of that moment. So, yeah. So do you, do you, um, do you create sounds or do you, do you just take sounds that's already there and apply them to certain things? Both. Uh, I, I usually start by just with myself, a little tape recorder and my voice. Uh, which is how we landed on a lot of the beeps and boops for Wrath of Khan. You know, it was, we we found that high-pitched beeps uh, create more tension than, than the lower, the lower register boop. 
it mm -hmm. really it when they're on the bridge and you hear a low register boop you know that everything is safe on the ship there's there's no tension to be had here but as soon as things start beep 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 beep, beep boop you know a low mm -hmm. boop interspersed into a, many high pitched beeps unsettling now that you've done that now that you've experienced stardom you know what I'm saying with with the uh with the beeps and the boops what's What's next? What's next for Jesse? You know, I really want to focus on a solo project. So I'm thinking of making a solo album of sounds. I it it is quite the undertaking, and I'm a little intimidated because again, I'm 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 not a musician, but uh, mm. I I do believe there is a soundscape that could affect us in the same way music could. Um, okay, so. For those listening, uh, what do you what do you want to say to them? To all the, the the children out in the world that's trying to find that thing that they love to do, can you give them a little word of encouragement? Just follow what makes you feel zippiest. You know, Jess, I want to thank you for um, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your knowledge, your expertise. So, thank you all for listening to the interview portion of the Novelizers. I have been Kevin Carter. Please enjoy the rest of the podcast. I feel so much smarter than I did eight to ten minutes ago. Our next chapter was novelized and narrated by Robot Chicken's Kevin Shinnick. Mr. Shinnick, engage. Chapter 6, Showtime, novelized and narrated by Kevin Shinnick. The space lab, known as Regula One, made its way over the curvature of the planet's atmosphere not unlike the seti eel that now made its way over the curvature of Pavel Chekhov's brain, the only difference being the eel didn't require scheduled union breaks. It had been two days since the Botany Bay leader placed the larva into the Starfleet commander's ear, rendering him susceptible to Khan's suggestions, an act which, moving forward, would forever be referred to as slipping a Mickey into a white Russian but for now was merely a nameless but much-needed step if Khan was to use Chekhov as a puppet to retrieve information about Project Genesis, a process that could create life in areas where there was none, and a precursor to Project Phil Collins, which could remove life from any festive atmosphere. But as the seti eel dragged its tentacles over Chekhov's membrane on its way toward his cerebral cortex, an unexpected side effect had occurred— Hidden memories, some lost to time, others buried out of fear or embarrassment, resurfaced in a manner so vivid, Chekhov could see them as clear as the nipples on Khan's muscular pecs. Memories, like the teenage taunts he suffered for having such a thick Russian accent, despite being a fourth-generation family living in San Francisco. Or the time his mother found him logging on to pravdahub.core, but mostly it was the debacle of the sixth grade play that came rushing back, an event so traumatic he considered it his most embarrassing entry among all his checkoff logs, second only to his decision to refer to anything as a checkoff log. Pavel Chekhov's father, Havel, was a huge fan of the theater. In fact, he had named his son Pavel in the hopes that they would one day form their own theater troupe going so far as to having the slogan Havel and Pavel, a father-son act that's incredibly novel, shaved into the side of a bear. Like many Russians, Havel was exceptionally proud of his surname and would often suggest he was related to the famous 19th century playwright Anton Chekhov, the same way people tend to claim a shared lineage with the 19th century Astors, the 20th century Yankovics, or the 21st century CryptoArena.coms. So it was with particular pride that Havel told his friends that his son had been cast in his first school play, a theatrical rendering of the film Enemy Mine, which had originally starred Academy Award winner Louis Gossett Jr., back when awards existed, and a then-strapping Dennis Quaid. Granted, Chekhov would only have one line, the ever-important, by order of Willis E. Davidge. But Havel saw it as a launching point for his son's acting career, and Pavel saw it as a chance to shed the stigma of having a Russian accent and a bad pageboy haircut. So much attention was paid to character development, however, that Chekhov spent very little time on his actual line. In fact, when he made his entrance, he ad-libbed the phrase, What's up? Trying to sound as American as he could. 
But when the non-binary, horoscope-avoidant biped, playing the general of the bilateral Terran alliance, uttered his cue of, Upon whose orders? Chekhov froze. By order of the... He stammered before going blank. Too embarrassed to call for line, Chekhov resorted to the oft-used theatrical tradition of blinking three times in the hopes of signaling to the stage manager that he needed help. Sadly, not only was the stage manager not up on his theatrical traditions, but also he was blind. Since, ironically, another theater tradition was to go the non-traditional route when hiring both cast and crew. And so, stage manager Johnson, who coincidentally was on the waiting list for Project Wonder, a process which could hopefully create sight where none existed, did not see his plea. As a result, Chekhov stared off into the distance, searching for the words, but finding, instead, only his father's look of shame. The children laughed and pointed, hurling slurs like, Amateur! Foreigner! And the particularly biting, Let Yakov Smirnov the Ninth do it! It was this debacle that made Chekhov quit the theater altogether and enlist in Starfleet, a decision he hoped would take him light years away from this awkward moment. And yet, ironically, here he was again, years later, putting on another play of sorts for the crew of Regula One. Only this time, Chekhov would not be performing for his father, but rather for the notorious Khan Noonien Singh, whose review would be nothing short of life or death. As Chekhov's fingers shakily reached for the intercom that would open a channel to Regula One, his brain ran over his, this time, well-rehearsed lines. He imagined the scientists of the space lab talking about their computers the same way Chekhov was thinking about his own brain. I don't think there's another piece of information we could squeeze into the memory bank, one would say. Next time, we'll design a bigger one. But Chekhov wanted to prove he didn't need a bigger brain. His current one would be enough. He would be enough. And with that, Chekhov pressed the intercom, sending a signal to the ship. On the deck of Regular One, the ensign known as Sleeveless Steve alerted the crew to the call. Dr. Marcus, comp pick coming in on hyperchannel. It's the Starship Reliant. On screen, please, she replied. The monitor came to life, and Chekhov was greeted by the faces of Dr. Carol Marcus and her son, Science Officer David. Granted, it had been a risk naming her son Science Officer David, but fortunately he did, in fact, wind up in that line of work. Their expressions were friendly enough, but for some reason Chekhov was inexplicably hoping for the glare of some imaginary stage lights to shield him from their possible judgmental reactions. Oh well, he thought. What was it his third-generation father used to say? Ah, yes. The show must go on. Chekhov took a deep breath and launched into a performance 30 years in the making. Come in, please, he began. This is Reliant calling Regular One. Repeat, this is USS Reliant, he said, smiling inwardly at his decision to ad-lib the word repeat before adding the more detailed description of USS. Was he being too cocky, he feared? Too showy? Remembering back to his ad-lib moment of What's up? No, he thought. This was not a misstep. This was him merely wetting his whistle. If he could convince the crew of his authenticity with his first line, the rest would be a piece of baklava. Dr. Marcus responded, Commander, we are receiving. This is regular one. Go ahead. A spark flickered in Chekhov's eyes. Showtime. Ah, Dr. Marcus, he beamed. Good. We're en route to you and should be there in three days. A look of confusion came over the doctor's face. En route? Why? We weren't expecting you for another three months. Has something happened? Nothing has happened, he said in his most cheerful manner. Set the Alpha 6 has checked out. Careful, Pavel, he thought to himself. Feel the enthusiasm. Don't show it. Then I don't understand, she continued. Why are you coming? We have received new orders, he interrupted. Upon arrival at Regular One, all materials of Project Genesis will be transferred to this ship for immediate testing on SETI Alpha 6. Chekhov could tell from David's reaction that his performance was convincing. Who in the hell do they think they are? The young man shouted. Please be quiet, Dr. Marcus yelled trying to calm the team before turning her attention back to the bearer of bad news. Commander Chekhov, this is completely irregular. I have my orders, he sneered, knowing he had hooked them. In fact, he was about to triumphantly end his transmission, his thoughts already on where they would hold the closing night party, when David added, 
Who gave the order? Chekhov froze. Flashes of his long-ago castmate asking him, Upon whose orders? echoed through his brain. Who did give the order? Willis E. Davidge, he thought? No, that was years ago. This was now. Who gave the order? He knew this. He had rehearsed this. And yet here he was again, sweating like a Klingon on karaoke night. The image of his father's disappointed look filled Chekhov's eyes. The laughter of the children pierced his ears. No seti eels were needed this time. These images slithered down memory lane on their own volition. Chekhov tried to speak, hoping his brain would remember the line before he reached the end of his sentence. The order comes from... But nothing came. Chekhov instinctively blinked three times, signaling to a non-existent stage manager, but this time there was no one in the wings except a heartless, genetically enhanced theater critic. Chekhov knew better than to look to Khan for assistance. He had seen Khan's wrath in action, felt his anger, knew his hatred for... Suddenly a smile formed on Chekhov's face. Admiral James T. Kirk, he finally said with relief, the line rushing back to his mind almost as quick as the blood rushing back to his face. Chekhov's relief was so great it blocked out the chaos that had now erupted from the unhappy crew. I knew it, I knew it, David yelled. All along, the military wanted to get their hands on... This is completely improper, Commander Chekhov, Dr. Marcus interrupted. I have no intention of allowing Reliant or any other unauthorized personnel access to our work or materials. But Chekhov was too elated to care. I'm sorry you feel that way, Doctor. Admiral Kirk's orders are confirmed. Please plan to deliver Genesis to us upon our arrival. Reliant out. As he depressed the intercom... Chekhov breathed a sigh of relief before turning to face his biggest critic. Khan, who had remained silent this whole time, finally glanced at Chekhov. An eternity seemed to pass, but then, unprompted, Khan spoke. Well done, Commander. Chekhov smiled, and out of some ingrained sense of obligation, added, You realize, sir, they will attempt to contact Admiral Kirk and confirm the order. But both men knew this was irrelevant, because this moment was no longer about Project Genesis. It was about Project Chekhov, for new confidence had been created in a world where there was none before. Chekhov knew it, Khan knew it, and he emphasized as much with a slow nod of the head. Wow. Just wow. And also, yay. Anywho, that's our episode for today. Join us next time to hear an all-new chapter narrated by Patton Oswalt. Until then, Kevin, land this spaceship. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to this week's guest contributors, Liz Lint, Mary Jo Peel, Kevin Shinnick, and Jesse Glasgow. Links to their fabulous books, swag, and cameo accounts can all be found in the show description. The Novelizers was created by Stephen Levinson, produced by Stephen, Chris Karwowski, and Rob Kuttner, and edited, mixed, and mastered by Chris Karwowski. Music by Cole Emoff, Andrew Lynn, Mike Wilson, and Chris Messick. Special thanks to Sarah Maid, Crystal Dennis, Dennis DeClaudio, and Hannah Levinson. Follow The Novelizers on Instagram and Twitter at The Novelizers, or visit TheNovelizers.com. The Novelizers is a work of parody, unauthorized by Paramount, Roddenberry Entertainment, or Star Trek. I'm Andy's intern, Kevin Carter. Live long and prosper, y'all. Novelizers out.